uh, when I uh, helped give communion today, I got to see everyone's face, and I hadn't realized how many people's face I have not seen up close. Like, you're all just like, you know, a mass. So it was nice to, I realized I don't know anybody. Hello? Okay. Um, so last talk, and uh, now we're going to kind of go through the whole thing, and this is the butterfly. Um, so we talked about brokenness. We talked about transformation, our work. We talked about the cocoon, God's work, the Eucharist. And now we're going to talk about what the butterfly looks like. What is the image and likeness of God? Um, and again, we're going to go back to this icon. This is the icon of Christ and Adam. And we see Adam's face looks like Jesus' face. right? He's in the image and likeness of God. right? And so here we become... We take the second Adam and we become in his image and likeness. And then the last thing we're going to do is transform. Uh, so we, we went through all of those things, and now we help transform others with God. Oh, is this a clip? No. There's a picture. Oh, I did it wrong. I hate it when that happens. Please hold. Okay, I think I know how to do this. Double... Send to back. Okay. I know what you're all thinking. Mad skills. Yep. All right. So this is the, this is the, you guys remember this scene? This is when he fell in. And actually this morning, uh, for some reason, I thought about this scene. And I'm like, this scene has to mean something. And I, I, it, it sort of hit me that this was his baptism. And when he fell in the water, the old man died right and he was when he came out of the water he was a new man right and you can see everyone greeting him like we greet a baby that comes out of the baptismal font like look at you you're different now you're a new creation you're, you're starting this process of transformation but what i liked about this scene as well is you see all of the saints gathered and they're helping transform the limbless man right and this becomes our role as Christians, and we see it here, right? Now he, after he does his dive and he joins the butterfly circus, he starts to speak to others and inspiring them in that very moving scene where the little boy who's on crutches, who's crippled, comes and gives him a hug, right? It's, a, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a moving scene, um, and you can see the Mendez, the, the top hat, the, the top hat there, the showman, he's watching, right, from, from the distance as this new creation starts to teach others. So this, this verse, it is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And St. Paul, when he says that, that's such a powerful statement, right? His movements, his thoughts, his actions, they're Christ coming through him, right? And so this is, this is our ultimate goal as Christians, right? When people look at us, they don't see us. They see Christ. Right? When they look at us, they don't see the caterpillar. They see a butterfly, right, in, in God's image. And, you know, when you, when you hear stories about Abu Nubh Shoy Kamil, um, when he came to the United States uh, the first time, like 1976, I was living in New Jersey at the time when he came, and I actually have a picture of me sitting on his lap, which is really cute. I was very cute. I, I had hair. Um, and uh, I was smaller. And anyway, so I'm sitting on his lap, and so many people, and, and my uncle was uh, the priest in Jersey City at the time, and he told me that after Abu Nabshoi left, so many people came to him and said, we didn't know who Jesus was until we met him. I mean, imagine the powerful statement. They grew up in churches in Egypt in wherever. They immigrated to America, and then they say, we didn't know who Christ was until we met him, right? And you're like, that is the ultimate validation that's the ultimate victory that's the ultimate goal of all of us right not that that's the goal right it's that he he became like christ he took on the image of christ so much remember this verse the one by saint carlos saint cyril right by melting two candles together you get one new candle bye guys <laughs> um they're waving so i had to i had to wait back right just by melting two candles together, you get one new candle, and it's one that's infused. I mean, one that's infused by the two, right? So this is our objective, right? This is what we are called to be. So 
as we live in this, uh, sorry, as we enter into life with God, we become like him. We start to talk like him, think like him, act like him, understand like him, have compassion like him, right? I mean, it, it struck me when I was younger, right? And I would complain about somebody to Abuna, um, Abuna Antonius, and he would redirect my gaze in a way, and he'd say, well, maybe they're going through this, or maybe they have this pain in their life here, or maybe, and he would help me see them, right? And he would help me see the person the way Christ saw people, right? And that's the ultimate goal, right? As I get closer to someone, I start to act and talk and think like them, All right? I've, I've told this, this story so many times, but, you know, when I was in, in high school, uh, I had a friend who used to always say the word scrub. How many people have heard me tell this story? I a few people. No one? Okay, good. Two people. All right. Um, and he, every time he's talked, he says, hey, scrub, what's up, scrub? How you doing, scrub? And I don't know why, what that even means, right? He just said that, okay? I'm in ninth grade. What do you think I was saying after a few weeks? To everybody, right? I said it once to my dad by mistake. Is scrub da, eh, shve, right? Never did that again. So, um, you start to acquire the characteristics. And one of the characteristics we acquire is to love like God does. And this is, why, the, by the way, why we study theology. For those of you who study theology and study things, we don't study things so we can become academics. I mean, if you want to teach at a seminary, feel free. But we're not academics. We're not studying the Word of God to learn things. We learn theology because that's our dad. And I want to learn about my dad. And I want to know who and what he is. And I want to understand him. Right? So that why? I can be like him. Right? This, is, this is theology. And that's why the fathers tell us the true theologian is what? The man who stands and prays. The true theologian is the man who stands and prays. Right? It isn't about degrees. It isn't about reading a bunch of books and quoting a bunch of fathers in different ways. So who is this God? And this is our creator, our father, and the being we want to end up look, looking like. And this is, you know, we, we talk a lot about this, right? As a father and a son, a father always wants his son to be the best. And he always wants his son to have, and he's, the father or the mother is always happy when the children are in their image, right? In their likeness. And we see this, right? When a little baby is born, right? The mom and dad are really happy that the, the kid has his face, right? And his characteristics and his nose and his hands and his eyes. But then as they get older, the parents are happy when the child takes on the likeness of the, of the parent, right? They talk and they act like the parents. They, they handle situations in a wise way, right? The first time your parents, you know, you do something in a way that impresses your parents. They look at you and they say, that's how exactly how I would have handled it, right? That's a, that's a big thing for a parent, right? It's a big moment when your child handles a, a difficult situation exactly like you would have handled it. Right? And this is what we're trying to do. Right? This, is, this is what God wants of us. He wants us to be his children in his likeness. Right? And so when I read the Gospels and I look at the way Christ handled people and handled situations and handled all kinds of things, I think to myself, that's you know, God's thinking, I want you to handle things like I did. Did you see his face? This moment? Right? When, this is right after the dive right after the limbless man dove and he was speaking to the kids. And this, this moment, it just always gets me, that, 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 that joy, right? And I imagine God looking at us like that, right? When we love another, when we serve the way he would have done it, looking at us with so much happiness and joy. And right after this scene, does anyone remember how, what he did? He walked off and he started dancing. He was so happy, right? And this, I imagine this to be our reaction when we see our children, our Abuna's reaction when he sees his kids growing, God's reaction when he sees us in his, his image and his likeness. So I love this quote by St. Augustine. A Christian is a mind through which Christ thinks, a heart through which Christ loves, a voice through which Christ speaks, and a hand through which Christ helps. So what he's saying here is that our hands, our thoughts, they're, they're Christ's. And we become this vehicle, 
right? We become the temple of the Holy Spirit and everything moves through us, right? And this is the, this is the verse that St. Peter talks about, right? When he says that through all these, you may be a partaker of the divine nature. So we're called to be partakers of this divine nature. And there's this great book. Has anyone read this book? Partakers of Divine Nature. I, I read this book 20 years ago. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Especially because the author's name is Christophorus Stavropoulos. Which right there, I mean, if you don't want to pick that one up, I don't know which one you would. Like Barnes and Noble. Okay. Right? So St. Athanasius has this lovely analogy. He says, just by analogy, God is to Christians as the sun is to the moon. As the sun is the exclusive source of light, so God is the sole source of glory. As the moon reflects light, so believers reflect God's glory. Right? So he's, and, and, and it's pretty impressive that he knew this at the time, right? You guys know the moon is what? It's just a dead rock, right? There's no light. It has no source of energy. It's nothing, okay? But at night, it gives light. It gives light to the darkness, right? And so what St. Athanasius is saying He's saying, look, you're just a rock. You're just dust, right? But when you light up, it's my light, right? And just like the sun lights up the moon, and then the moon lights up the darkness of the world, that's what we're called to be. So we're called to be the moon. We're called to reflect the light of Christ, right? So at night, you may think there is no sun. You say, where'd the sun go? But you see the moon, and you go, I know there's a sun because the moon's lit up, right? And so sometimes people look and say, where's God? And then you'll say, what happened? I thought you didn't believe in God. Well, I met this person. And that's it. I saw God in that person. That person loved me. That person took me in. That person cared. So I didn't see God, but I saw them. I saw the moon. So I knew there was a God. I knew there was a sun. This quote by Father Matthew is one of my favorites. Is Kiro here? Philo? He's asleep. Alhamdulillah. So God created man in his own image so that man should bear witness in himself to God's self. I just love the way he writes too. Man bears witness in himself to God's self. So we are, we're the ones who bear the, witness, the image of God in ourselves. Right? And God uses us to bear his image as well. All right, I'll go a little faster. This is a very convicting quote. There would be no need for sermons if our lives were shining. There would be no need for words if we bore witness with our deeds. There would be no more pagans if we were true Christians. This one, this one stings. Right? And this is St. John Chrysostom. He's a bishop talking to his flock, his priests, his everybody, right? And this ultimately, guys, this is it. I love this quote because this quote kind of summarizes the thing, which is don't talk a lot. Don't give a lot of talks like this one. Don't do a lot of, you know, preaching and proclaiming and, and I got to go find people and I got to go. Just be, be, you know, every once in a while, uh, you know, at, at St. Paul's, I, I was in charge of Sunday school, and people would come up to me and go, you know, I really want to get back into church, and I want to start serving. You know, and I want to start my religious life, and I want to start my spiritual life, and I want to start serving Sunday school. And my reaction was always kind of like, you know, you could just be a Christian. You don't actually have to do anything. Why don't you just be? Right? Be this light to your coworkers. Be the light to your house, to your wife, to your kids. Just be. Be a Christian. Right? Let your deeds do the talking. You don't have to give a talk to a bunch of fourth graders who aren't listening anyway right? to be a Christian. That's not how it works. Abun Abshoi Kamil again. People don't need to hear about Christ anymore. They have heard enough. They ne rather need to see Christ in us. He said this in the 60s. <laughs> there was no SoundCloud. There was no YouTube. There's no Facebook. Imagine how much we've heard about Christ now. TV, mega churches putting out sermons everywhere. And in the 60s, he was saying, I think people have heard enough. And they just barely invented audio tapes at that point. I think it was eight track still. This is huge, guys. People have heard enough. 
enough sermons, enough talks. It's time to be. It's time to be the image of God in the world. Go and be a butterfly and let the world see you. So one of God's char characteristics is he's a creator. Now this one's kind of strange, right? So I'm supposed to be in the image and likeness of God. Okay, that's good. He's good. I'm good. I should be good. He doesn't do evil. I should not do evil. He was nice to people. I should be nice to people. But one of the characteristics of God is he's a creator. How does that one gel? That one's kind of weird. How do, I, how, how do I become a creator? I can't create. That's a, a characteristic exclusively to God. So God creates, he builds up, he transforms, he develops from less to more, he moves from darkness to light, he purifies and refines, he takes evil and turns it into good. So God creates in many ways. So then how do I manifest and reflect this characteristic of God? How do I become a creator? And this one is a little harder to think about, so I chose to talk about it. How and whom do I create and build? I'm just a guy. I don't have creative powers. And there he is. Do you guys see his hand? All right, so that's the beggar on the street. I love this statue. And his hand has a hole in it. So it's clear I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. I was naked and you clothed me. So this is, uh, this verse always gets me. So this is Matthew 25. And this is the judgment day. All right, this is the, this is the end. He says, I separate the sheep from the goats, the left from the right. And this is how I separate them. This is it. This is the list. Right? All the other things we do aren't on this list. This is the list. And so then who are the poor and needy? Are they the people on Skid Row, homeless? Sure. People in Egypt, lots of homeless people in Egypt, sure. Who else? Is it just the poor and needy? Are there other people poor and needy? Yeah, look around, right? All of us, in one way or another, poor and needy, right? I'm sure all of you, at some point in this retreat, heard someone tell a story about someone in their family, in their own lives, how their parents interact with them, that let you know how much they were hurting, how much pain there is. So all of us in all of our lives are poor and needy. And it isn't limited to just feeding the homeless or feeding the hungry. We all have this situation, right? In the litany of the sick that we heard this morning, he says, in, in dungeons, in prisons, do you know anyone in dungeon or in prison? Yeah, you do. Are there people in prison in their own minds? Are there people trapped in their own lack of self-esteem and their own fear and their own anxiety and their own loneliness? Are there people in those kind of dungeons? Everywhere. They're everywhere. Right? So these are the people we're called, these are the poor and needy. Right? God is long-suffering and merciful to you. This you experience many times every day. Be long-suffering and merciful to your brethren. It's that simple. He treats you with respect. Treat other people with respect. He gives you a free will. Give other people a free will. He loves you unconditionally. Love other people unconditionally. And then this quote by St. Isaac the Syrian. Again, he's one of my favorite saints. Spread your cloak over those who fall into sin, each and every one, and shield them. Another service. Right? Unfortunately, when, when people sin, sometimes what do we do? We put them on blast. We tell everybody. We post. We shame. We cancel. We attack. And he's saying, don't do that. 
And I was kind of shocked during some of the, 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 the craziness of COVID when people would post about people who were bad, right? And you, you find a whatever, a racist or a, or a bigot or a homophobe or a whatever you find, and people would post about them very hateful things, and it happened on all sides. You know, a, a teacher who was uh, gay in a school, and they would post all about this person, put his picture up, and attack him viciously. And you, you compare it to this verse, and then people would use the excuse, I'm raising awareness. You see, I'm raising awareness. I don't think you are. I think you're attacking another human being's brokenness. You're attacking their sin. And you're not doing what St. Isaac said. He said, spread your cloak over those who have sinned. Do you guys know this story about St. Macarius? It's a very famous story. There's a monk who's sleeping around. And this woman would come visit his cell. So the other monks go to St. Macarius and they say, this guy, he's been sleeping around. This woman comes to his cell. They hang out a long time, blah, blah, blah. And St. Macarius, no, 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 you guys, it's all in your head. And he goes, they're like, okay, Father, whatever. And then they see her walk into his cell. They're like, okay, now we got him. They go running to St. Macarius. They say, she's in there right now. Let's go right now. You'll catch her. You'll catch him in the act. She's there right now. St. Macarius looks at these evil monks. Says, okay, let's go. He walks over. He knocks on the door. He hears a lot of shuffling. <laughs> uh, one second, all right? And then, you know, the monk comes out a few minutes later. He goes, hi, Father, welcome. He goes, oh, I'm just coming to visit. He goes, oh, come on in. So St. Macarius takes one step in. He looks quickly around the room. He figures out where she's hiding. He sees a big basket. That's the only place she could be hiding. What does he do? Who knows the story? He sits on the basket. And then he looks at the monks, and he goes, oh, search the room. Now, they know what he's doing, and he knows what he's doing, and they know he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and they just kind of stare, and they're like, all right, we'll leave. And they did. They just turned around and were shamed, right? And, of course, as he walks out, he looks at the monk, and I'm sure he gave him a look, like, let's clean it up, and walks out. Right? Cover the sins of others. Spread your cloak over them. Protect them. We say this in the liturgy of, in the prayer of thanksgiving, you have covered us. I remember Buna Tedros Melody saying, talking about this, you have covered us. What does that mean? That means you've hidden our sins from everybody. And it's a beautiful thing, thank God. I mean, I don't have sins because I'm an archdeacon, but others, <laughs> horrible. So from yesterday's talk, what happens at liturgy again? We become a part of Christ, we become a part of each other. Uh, when Anthony Paul has this great blog, I don't know if you guys have ever followed it, but it's really nice. He says, the gospel says to comfort the sad, to feed the hungry, to clothe the poor, to visit the imprisoned. These are both literal and spiritual in their manifestations. Someone may, may need to be clothed not just physically, but because they feel naked. Someone may need a visit in their prison, not just a physical one, but a metaphorical one, the prison of their thoughts or their sadness. Someone may need you to walk with them two miles because they need your help carrying something or because they need someone to talk about their thoughts, their lives, and their challenges. So don't limit yourself to serving the poor as only serving the poor. Of course, serving the poor is fantastic. Right? But the poor and needy are all around in many ways, in, in all around in all the churches. As for us, Pope Crillo says, let us disappear so that Christ may be manifest. Right? Let the God inside us be what people see. Okay. So how do we give to others? How do we build others? This quote by St. Therese, I love it. Saint, she says, I am a little brush that Jesus has chosen in order to paint his image in the souls he has entrusted to my care. An artist doesn't use only one brush, but needs several. The final brush is great and useful as it applies the general tints. The first brush, sorry, is great and useful as it applies the general tints and covers the canvas entirely in a very short time. Right? You imagine a big rolling brush, right? Another brush, a much smaller one, he uses for details. God may wish to do a great work in the souls of his children through others, yet I may be the very small brush he deems to use afterward for the smallest details. 
So this, this image is very powerful. She says, you're like an iconographer. And the iconographer paints, and he finishes, and he touches. St. Athanasius uses the same expression in his book on the Incarnation. He says, we're like the image of Christ that's become distorted. So now look at this icon. Is it finished? Not yet. How would you finish it? I have an idea. Take a hammer and hit it. Keep pounding the icon. Good idea, bad idea. Will it finish that way? Will you make it better? Will it look like Jesus if you do that? Is that what we do to each other? When something is not good in another person, something is ugly, something is unfinished, what do we do? We hit him with a hammer. It doesn't work. That's not how you finish an icon. And that's not how you finish your fellow man and make them into the image of Christ. You don't stab it with a knife and say, why aren't you more Jesus-like? You're disgusting. You're full of anger and jealousy, and you're just a, a witch and a blah, blah, blah. And we hit, and we attack. This doesn't finish people. It destroys them. No one can feel hatred towards those for whom he prays for. When you find yourself hating someone, I've never done that. I'm an archdeacon. But when you do, the easiest way to get around it, I find, I mean, that's what other people have told me, <laughs> is I pray for them. I don't pray that they stop bothering me. That's different. All right, if I have a, a boss who's a jerk, and I say, Lord, please let my boss appreciate how awesome I am. Please let him stop being a jerk to me. Please let him not get upset when I'm five minutes late. Please let him, what am I doing? I'm, I'm weaponizing God. This guy is causing me a problem. I don't like that problem. I'm going to throw my God at him, and then that will make my life easier. Who do I love? Myself, a lot. And so then I'm going to use God to make him not suck so that I can be happy. God is a tool, a weapon I use for my own ego, my own enjoyment. That's not prayer. It sounds like prayer, but it isn't. Oh, again, one of my Anthony, Metropolitan Anthony Bloom, unless we see, unless we look, sorry, long weekend, <laughs> as Abuna said during the sermon. That was funny. <laughs> Hang on, I can't remember what I wrote. <laughs> Unless we look at a person and see the beauty there is in this person, we can contribute nothing to him. Okay, I want to just stop there. Unless you see beauty in the person in front of you, just stop. Stop. Don't go on and tell them what's wrong with them or what's broken with them or why they pissed you off. Unless you see beauty in them, you can contribute nothing to them. One does not help a person by discerning what is wrong, what is ugly, what is distorted. Christ looked at everyone he met, at the prostitute, at the thief, and saw the beauty hidden there. Perhaps it was distorted, perhaps it was damaged, but it was beauty nonetheless. And what he did was to call out this beauty. And every person he saw, he called out beauty. He said, I like this about you. Right? And that's, that's, the, that's the Christian way. We don't hit unfinished icons with hammers in hopes that they look nice when we're done. Okay. I'm going fast because So let's not forget the basics. Uh, St. Pisos has this nice quote. He says, if you want to help the church, and I'm going to replace church with society, school, uh, the world, earth, whatever, it is better to try to correct yourself rather than be looking to correct others. Now this is really important because it comes back to something that I see happening, especially in social media where people want to call out other people, right? It could be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to raise awareness, I'm trying to shame, I'm trying to, you know, point out the bad things that, you know, this sort of behavior ends. 
But what Elder Pryusis is saying is different than that. He's saying it's better to just try to correct yourself rather than be looking to correct others. If you manage to correct yourself, one small part of the church is immediately corrected. Naturally, if everyone did the same, the body of the church would be in good health. But today, and he's talking about the 50s, people concern themselves with anything but themselves. You see, ju judging others is easy, whereas working on yourself takes effort. I think sometimes we want to judge others and we want to look at the ugliness of the world because it just makes me feel better about me. Right? When I see your brokenness and your mistakes and your sin, so what the church teaches us, and it has always taught us this, is we follow micro-Christianity, not macro-Christianity. Micro-Christianity is I change me first. Macro is I want to change everybody. And that just doesn't work. The, the, the approach of the church is always I follow a deep life of repentance and confession and killing of my own ego and my own self. And then God uses me the way he wants to use me. He lets whoever wants to see me, see me. He'll find the interactions. He'll do all of the things that needed to be done. But this process of let's change everybody, right? I mean, you guys know, like you can ask your mom to say, mom, have you been able to change dad in the 30 years of marriage? She's gonna say, say mahowa, nila, right? He still throws his underwear on the thing. Lisa Zemho. You know, right? And she'll say other things. Um, so here you have proof in your own homes, right? A spouse spending her whole life trying to break this guy. And she can't. She can't change him. And that's her spouse. Right? So you can't even change your spouse. And it's really hard to change yourself. How many of you have struggled with yourself for 10 years, 40 years, right? So just changing me is a miracle, right? And then every once in a while, you know, I, I work at USC and I'll be walking by like a board or something, you know, a, a posting board, and they'll say, come change the world. And you're like, really? I can't even change me. How am I going to change the world? How am I going to make everything better? And so what Elder Paisu is saying is a very important principle of Christianity. Fix me, become the light of the world, and then let God work through you. Not, look, I see your sin, I see your sin, I see your sin. I'm going to point these out to you people so that you become better. You know, you know Michael Jackson once said, right? I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him if he'll change his ways. No message could have been any clearer. Okay, we're not going to sing it because I can't hit those notes. But if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make the change. Right. <laughs> you people will clap at anything. So easily entertained. All right, so... <laughs> That's enough, Michael Jackson. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think, what's that? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll, read, I'll read you one more quote. Uh, I think this says the same thing as Elder Pacius, so I'll move on, and then I'll, I'll end with this. Radiating Christ, dear Jesus, and maybe we all close our eyes and say this prayer together. Help us to spread your fragrance everywhere we go. Flood our souls with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess our whole being so utterly that our lives may only be a radiance of yours. Shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel your presence in our soul. Let them look, upon, look up and see no longer us but only Jesus. Stay with us, and then we shall begin to shine as you shine. So to shine as to be a light to others. The light, O Jesus, will all be from you. None of it will be ours. It will be, your, it will be you shining on others through us. 
Let us thus praise you in the way you love best, by shining on those around us. Let us preach you without preaching, not by words, but by our example, by the catching force, the sympathetic influence of what we do, the evident fulfillness of the love our heart bear to you. Amen. And that's the final slide of the retreat. Does any... So at the end of spiritual talks, we always say, and glory be to God forever. And the reason we do that is because when you clap, you are praising me, and I don't want to be praised because I just stole slides from other people, right? So I just took quotes from saints and said them to you out loud, right? So uh, anyway, don't clap. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Does anybody have any... Homar, <laughs> Homar. Uh, um, does anybody have any questions, comments, thoughts, anything? All right, MCs, take the mic. Hello. Uh, 